Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Edge Church. We're excited to have you here with us on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. We've got a great service in store for you today as we wrap up our Active Discipleship Sermon Series. And let me tell you, after uh, hearing Pastor Neil's message this morning and the powerful testimony that comes at the end of it, I think this is gonna be something that really ties together really why we've been leaning into active discipleship and just the power that proclaiming the gospel can have in our lives and on the lives of others around us. So you are really gonna to wanna to be tuned into the, to the message. Before we get started with that powerful word though, we wanna just give you a couple updates on what's happening in the life of the Edge Church. You know that we've got that full list of events on our events section of the website right now, edgeaurora.com slash events. And we always encourage you to go there to check out what's going on because we've got a lot of things going on this summer. But there are two things that are coming up here in June in just a couple weeks that we wanna make sure you're tuned into. The first one of that is our Kane County Cougar game that we're doing as a family outing on June 11th. Remember, this is also a fundraiser for our youth. We've got a goal of uh, selling 100 tickets to that, and we're over a quarter of the way there. So there's already families that are plugged in saying, yeah, I want to go and have a great time with my family and with my church friends on that. So if you're interested, make sure you go over to that events page. You can also purchase those tickets right from our church website. And the other event that's coming up later that same week is going to be on June 16th and 17th, and that's our family camping trip. I know we've told you to save the dates on those, but if you go back to the website now, you'll actually see the full details, the kind of schedule and suggested events that we have planned for you at that time. So you can find, really decide, is this something that you wanna do with your family? And I think after reading a little bit more about what we have planned for you that weekend, you're gonna say, this is gonna be something awesome uh, that I can really tap into with my family. And then lastly, if you have been blessed by the ministry and the teaching and the worship here at the Edge Church, would you prayerfully consider giving and supporting the everyday work that we do here? If so, head on over to edgeaurora.com giving, or you can text the number that's on your screen right now to find out more about how you can give back to this church community and support the work that God is doing in and through us. But right now, I am so excited for us to jump in today's sermon uh, in today's time of worship as we hear from Pastor Neil Shorey and hear just a powerful testimony from one of our very own, Eve Sunti. Hey, good morning, church. Good to be together today. Um, excited just to have a time for us just to lift up our voices and praise and thanksgiving to God and and as we do today I want to just read from Psalm 145 uh, just to fix our hearts and our, our minds on the goodness of God it says it says I will exalt you my God and my king and praise your name forever and ever I'll praise you every day yes I will praise you forever for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise no one can measure his greatness. It says, the Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone and showers compassion on his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell of your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and you rule through every generation. And so today we just, I want to just remind us that, that we come to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who is great and worthy of our praise. And no one, it says, can measure his greatness. So we're going to just lift up the name of Jesus together. We're going to lift up the name of the Lord. We're going to proclaim his goodness and his greatness. Let's sing this with me. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. And over the universe and over every heart, there is no I am name. Jesus, you reign above it all, and you reign above it all, you reign above it all. And over 
the universe and over every heart there is no iron name oh jesus you reign above it all yeah you reign above it all I've searched the world Oh, but it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures of faith Never enough Oh, and you came along Oh, and you put me back together Oh, and every desire, oh, is now satisfied, oh, here in your love. Oh, and there's nothing better than you know, there's nothing better than you know, there's nothing.
darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life sing that again Rain darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. And over the universe and over every heart, and there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. And on the cross, the work is finished God you pour out your life just to give us new life from the lips of the forgiven hear an anthem arise Jesus your life oh, you reign above it all you reign above Over the universe and over every heart, and there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth be wrapped in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. You reign above it all. Oh, you reign above it all. And you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. The seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. Oh, yeah, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Seated alone in glory, throned on the highest praise. Oh, yeah, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. You reign above it all, and 
And over the universe And over every heart There is no higher name Oh, Jesus, you reign Above it all Reign above it all So we live, you are forever live, you are I'm within our hearts, I'm within our minds. Jesus, you alone, right.
Well, good morning, everyone. I am so glad to be with you this morning as we are concluding our series called Active Discipleship. This has been a really long series, um, but I believe wholeheartedly it's been a very important one because we've been taking a deep dive into what it looks like for us to walk out what I would call followership of Jesus, like what it actually looks like to follow him. And it's our desire that you wouldn't just have information, but that it would be functional for you because we believe that the message of Jesus is the single most important message that you will ever hear or tell in your life. So today, we're going to be talking about the importance of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus, the, the telling of the story of Jesus. We've all heard the quote that's often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, and it says, Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. And this quote is, is it's much loved by, by those of us who are a little bit less comfortable using our words. Like, we don't always want to share about Jesus. We'd rather just sort of live it out and, and let people catch on. Um, but the truth is that while we certainly should live out this life of Jesus, we should live out a changed life, um, we should live lives that look different than the average person in, in, in our cultural context. Uh, when we do that, though, sometimes people in the culture will ask us, like, what's different about us? Like, why do you live differently? I've noticed that you act different in board meetings, or you're, you're, you're different in how you approach studying for tests. You're more honest. Like, we, we should look different, and we should get people asking us questions. That's what the Apostle Peter was referring to in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, when he wrote this. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I can say in my life, it's happened many times. Many times when I've just sort of lived the life that God has, has, has placed in me and called me to live. I've had people ask me uh, about why I, I live differently. But what would it look like, I want you to think for a second, what would it look like if when they asked me that, if I said, well, I guess you'll just have to keep watching and figure it out for yourself? Like, that sounds completely ridiculous. How silly would it be for us to just leave people hanging and, and, and wonder, well, how do I, what do I, what do I do with this? Like, I've watched you, but what, what's my action point? What's the step that, that I should take? Now, here's the thing. We know this deep down. God doesn't want us to leave people hanging and, and hoping that maybe they'll figure it out one day. And I'm sure glad that he didn't, didn't leave me in that condition. I, I've shared with most of you, at least a couple of times since I've been at the edge, the gist of my testimony. And if you're interested in hearing it because you haven't yet, reach out. I'd love to have coffee with you and share it. But, but the first part of my testimony was really essentially just simply asking um, God, uh, the, the cry of my heart. And I just said, God, if you're real, just reveal yourself to me. If you're real, reveal yourself to me. Real simple and honest prayer. But here's the problem. A revelation that God was real wasn't enough to save me. Like I recognized in one moment, I remember the moment I knew, wow, God, you just showed me that you are real. But I needed to know how to get on the path to salvation and in order to do that, I needed someone to explain it to me. I needed the proclamation of the gospel. And I am ever so grateful that God didn't just leave me. He didn't just walk away and say, well, I am real. Good luck with everything. And just hope that I would get it one day. But he met me tangibly. And I'm going to share that at the end of our time together today. But today, our focus is going to be on two passages. The first one is Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And the second is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. After Jesus' death and then his resurrection, he appeared to, to lots of people. We see this in the account of the Gospels. He did it to show people that he was alive. He, he substantiated his claims that he was going to die. And then on the third day, he would be raised from the dead by the power of God. And then he revealed himself to, to, to people and to, sh to show that it was true. He authenticated his resurrection. But as you might imagine, if you're really honest, if you suddenly saw someone who you thought had died and they were standing in front of you, you might have a lot of questions. You might be a little bit skeptical. You might wonder. 
So Jesus was met with shock and confusion and, and, and honestly, even a stubbornness by some of his followers who almost sort of refused to, to, to believe it. But in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus wasted no time at all in giving his followers their next steps. And the steps weren't to rest or to hide or to be afraid or to go back to everything that they did before they met him. But these were his orders. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. What he's saying is, it's your job to go and to tell, to proclaim. So here's our first idea today. This great commission is our divine mandate. The great commission is our divine mandate. Some of you might be thinking, what is this hour <laughs> you're talking about? Why does this have to be about us? Because I'm guessing that some of you grew up in churches that were more centralized in focus. Maybe you grew up in a, a different kind of Protestant church, more of a high church or in a Catholic church, and, and you were told by your pastor or your priest that um, you were supposed to just sort of do all these religious things. You had a, a list of things that you knew you were supposed to do, and there were some things that you were supposed to not do. And then you had to make sure to invite your friends and your family and anyone that you saw to the location called the church. And then you would hear a, a message from a qualified religious leader that happened to be the pastor or the priest. I want to be really clear about this. It is a good thing to invite people to gather. It's a good, good thing. These are great things, whether it's at the edge or another church community. Like we are about building the, the larger church. We'd love to have you here. But if this isn't your place, we want you to get connected to another church. So God is all about gathering people. I'm confident that where the Bible is preached and where people are seeking to follow Jesus and they're loving each other well, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed to be there because you're going to get a little taste of heaven on earth and you're going to see what Jesus is actually really like. But I also want to make sure that you don't think that's what this verse is all about. This divine mandate, the great commission from God is not aimed solely at religious leaders. And some of you introverts just got a little bit nervous, but it's directed by God and it's for every single follower of Jesus on the planet for all time. I would bet that some of you guys are thinking, if you listen to Pastor Steve's message from last week, some of you guys are thinking, but didn't Pastor Steve talk about spiritual gifts last week? And surely this falls under a spiritual gift. Well, the truth is teaching, particularly teaching the Bible, teaching about Jesus, is one of the gifts listed in a number of places in the New Testament of the Bible. Romans chapter 12, verses six through eight, is one passage that tells us about some of these gifts. Paul writes this. He says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So yes, teaching is one of those gifts, and it should undoubtedly be used. But do not confuse that with the divine mandate of God. It is inclusive of every single person who has received salvation through the grace of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us. That's for you and it's for me. If we're being real, I'm guessing that there's some of you who would actually listen to stories more if they weren't just from pastors. You know, you know, here's the thing. I'm not dogging pastors. I'm one of them. But I also recognize that sometimes when you hear pastors, you're like, well, maybe they're saying this because they're paid to say it. I, I understand that. I, I understand anyone questioning if someone's receiving money for a living. I get why you might have a question. Sometimes it means more to hear from someone who, who clearly isn't motivated by financial gain. I get it. And I also would say this, I believe that most pastors are doing this for the right reason. Most uh, aren't doing it for money. If we were doing it for money, we'd probably pick the wrong profession for most of us. But removing money from the equation takes away a significant reason for the doubtfulness of the truth of our claims of what we say about Jesus. 
One story that I love about Jesus is when Jesus met this woman in the Gospels, and, and she's described in the story as a woman at the well. The story is so powerful to me because little by little, Jesus invited this woman into a conversation, and, and ultimately he revealed to her a whole lot that he, he basically showed her through his questions and things that he would say to her that he knew about her. He knew her. He knew what her life was about. He knew about things that had happened to her and choices that she made. And it led her ultimately to believe that he was the savior of the world, and her savior too. Now, here's the thing. She ran out and told everyone, and, and, and she said, this, this, this guy came to me and he told me everything that I ever did. It's really powerful. And when someone meets Jesus for the first time, it's beautiful because they can't stop talking. When you meet Jesus... When you hear about him and it clicks for the first time, you can't keep it to yourself. John chapter 4 tells this whole story, but I'm going to read the results of this woman's encounter with Jesus in verses 39 to 42. It says, Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So she ran out after she was told and realized who Jesus was. She couldn't keep it to herself. So she ran out and many of the Samaritans believed in him because her story. She said, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, Jesus, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Yes, teaching is a spiritual gift. But sharing Jesus is for everyone who is empowered by the Spirit of God. And you're wondering, well, I don't feel very empowered. doesn't matter how you feel. Because if you are a Christian today, this is for you. You are empowered to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. It is your divine mandate. But when you think of almost anything as being mandatory, does that sound exciting to you? I just want to say this, like I recognize, like a lot of times you'll hear like, it's a mandatory meeting. Oh, great. So it's going to be a complete joy sucker, right? We feel that way mostly about things that are mandatory. But this mandate pays all kinds of dividends for the person who hears and for the person who shares. It's amazing. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, um, it's another version of the Great Commission, this divine mandate. And Jesus said this to, the, to his followers. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This plan of proclamation, this proclamation of God's story, it's so important to God that he doesn't leave you alone when you do it. When you share it, he walks with you everywhere, everywhere you go, as you go, he is there. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's not just with you. He's not just with you and, and walking along like sort of observing. He empowers you by the Holy Spirit to complete this mission that he has given you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells, tells us about it. it. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know what this means? This is incredible. God provides for every single thing that he requires of us. So he gives us a mandate and he walks with us, empowers us with the Holy Spirit to do it. You are not doing this alone. Here's our second thought for today. The divine mandate is part of our designed purpose. The divine mandate is part of our designed purpose. I did this this week. I Googled, um, what is my purpose? I, I, I would challenge you to do that today. And you can see that what I'm saying is true. You'll get around 6 billion, yeah, with a B, 320 million results. That tells me two things. A lot of people are trying to figure out why they're alive. Isn't it true? Like, what's your purpose? I don't know. Let's Google it. And it also tells me that there are a lot of different opinions about it. 
a lot of people are wondering, what's my purpose? And then a whole lot of people trying to answer that. Well, let me tell you what I think your purpose is. Here's the thing. I know I've tried a lot of things before I became a Christian. So many things I tried. And everything that I tried to make myself feel fulfilled left me wanting for more. There's always something. I. It was like this endless appetite to figure out what is my purpose? Where's my belonging? Now, if I'm being real, even as a Christian, as a pastor, there are times that I, when I'm not so fully centered in my faith, and, and, and I'm still left desiring more. Like there are times when I'm just like, yeah, I, what am I missing? I feel like I'm missing something. But what I can tell you is that even in those moments, when I read about purpose and significance in the Bible, 100% of the time, God meets me there and it rings true. Even in those times when I feel a little bit wandering in my heart, I know this is the point. This is where I find truth. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. We're going to start in verse 16, though, for the sake of context. This is what he wrote. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I don't know. Do you ever read something in the Bible and you're just like, it was familiar to you, but then it just hits you in a new way. For some reason that I just cannot fully grasp, this God who loved the world so much and sent Jesus to save us from our sins, for some reason wants to partner with us. He wants to partner with us so that we tell other people about him. It's like he saves us and then says, you're not just a servant, you're actually a partner on this mission. It's incredible. And in that short passage that I read to you from 2 Corinthians, we're told four incredible things that result from hearing, believing, and receiving the gospel of Jesus. Here's the first thing. We are new at our core when we receive the salvation of Jesus. And you know what that means? It means your foundation is now good. You aren't a wretched sinner. If you are saved, if you have the Spirit of God living in you, recognize who you are. You are saved. Your foundation, your core is good. Here's the second thing we know. That good foundation produces a new outlook on our relationships with other people, right? So as followers of Jesus with a new foundation, we don't any longer look at people as objects that, that are to be used to benefit us. But humans created in the image of God. There's a big difference. When you look at someone and you recognize this is a son or a daughter of God created in his image, when we know that God, we have this great sense of responsibility. There's a weightiness in how we treat people, never to be used, never to be manipulated, but to be honored and loved and cherished. We, we also need this new foundation um, that was given to us to understand, to have eyes that, that, that see um, the, the way we do when we become Christians. It's, it makes me think of the difference between, like I've got an iPhone. So many of you guys do, right? Lots of iPhones. Some of you guys have Androids. You just haven't seen the light yet, I guess. So uh, iOS 16 is very different than iOS 3. And I say that because I had a, a, a 3GS iPhone. It was my very first iPhone. And what you can do with the latest operating system, iOS 16 is entirely different than iOS 3. It's like light years ahead of it. And it's no different than when we are upgraded to this new operating system led by the Holy Spirit rather than our old, selfish, sinful natures. Our capacity grows. It's an incredible thing. Here's another thing it does. That new foundation that we get, it also causes us to see Jesus in a new way. I love what Tony Evans, as you can tell, I've quoted Tony Evans many times in sermons. He's one of my favorite, um, favorite pastors. Tony Evans wrote in his Bible commentary about Jesus. He said, he is no mere first century crucified Jewish man. Rather, he is the risen Savior and King seated at the right hand of the Father. That's powerful. 
That's the difference. When, when the Spirit of God enters us, we see Jesus not just as some good teacher, but the Savior, the, the one who brings dead things to life. And finally, God gives us uh, this royal identity. We are Christ's ambassadors. We've talked about identity a lot recently. We exist to carry his message. It's not about ours. It's about his. There is so much for us here in those four verses. It really creates a, a complete revolution in how we're wired. And that affects how we see and experience Jesus, other people, and it ultimately even reprograms our purpose. It changes us from being self-seeking to seeking the very highest good for our fellow humans, the salvation of their souls. What an unbelievable spiritual rehab project that God does in us when we receive the gift of salvation. You will never regret, you'll never regret experiencing the sense of belonging and purpose that you get when you operate in God's purposes, empowered by his spirit. And that leads us to our, our final point today. And it's the power of proclamation as evidenced by changed lives. The power of proclamation, the telling of the story is evidenced by the change in people's lives. And I, I don't know of any better way to talk about that than for you to hear from one who has been deeply impacted by the gospel, by the proclamation of the story of Jesus. Earlier in my sermon, I shared with you how I was thankful that God didn't leave me with only information that, that exists, but that, that, that he answers prayers and that he's real. Uh, but, but he followed through and revealed so much more to me because just a few weeks after I had the encounter of recognizing that God was real, I went to a church service. And I remember, um, I remember this worship pastor was leading songs, and they sounded so different to me from songs that I remembered from, from church experiences when I was younger. And people seemed really excited to be there, and I hadn't really seen that in church before. It could be The reality is it could be that I was just being awakened to it all. Um, but, but it was my experience. And um, in the middle of leading a, a song in worship, the worship pastor just stopped everything. He made the whole band stop. And he said, it is not usually my role to do this, but I just have this sense that God wants me to share what this is all about. Because I, I feel like he keeps telling me that there's someone here who doesn't understand. And I just had this weird feeling like he's going to say something and it's, and it's for me. And he went on to explain that so many people attempt to be good. They, they attempt to be good enough to get to God. And he said, but, but here's the problem with that. The whole message of Christianity is that God sent his son Jesus to come to earth, to, to live in a different way, a sin-free life, and to die for the sins, our sins, that we committed, that we can't pay for. And then he rose from the dead by the power of God in him so that we could have a bridge home to the Father. And I remember all in one moment, it just clicked. I understood it. I understood that I couldn't do anything to get to God myself, but Jesus made a way. And I remember in that moment in my heart, I just said, okay, Lord, I get it. That's what I want, I'm in. I said, yes. I said yes to Jesus because of the faithful proclamation of the gospel by that worship pastor. Never, ever underestimate what God can do with a willing person. And speaking of willing people, my good friend Eve Senti is going to share about how hearing the gospel, how she received the proclamation of the gospel, and it changed her life. Good morning. I've been asked to give my wonderful testimony to encourage you. Uh, some of you know me. My name is Eve Senti, and I've been at the edge for quite a while. But I don't think some of you know everything that brought me here. So I'd really like to share that with you today. I was born in 1946. Yes, I'm 76 years old. In war-torn Germany, where my parents fled from Hungary, it was being taken over by the communists and they did not want to live under communism. So in 1946, I was born to my parents and we lived in Germany for five years. Uh, it was a very difficult time. It was bombed out. There was uh, 
not enough food, uh, supplies were just minimal. And at one point, my parents did not have enough food to feed me, so the Allies had come in to start camps for children to feed them, and they took me there, which was really great. But I, I feel that that was probably one of my first steps of somewhat of abandonment, which I'll get into later in my testimony. But eventually my father uh, applied to the United States, and at the time you had to have a sponsor. And the, fortunately for us, the First Presbyterian Church of LaGrange sponsored our family to come over. So yes, we came over the Atlantic, and I guess I came through Ellis Island, got on a train and came to the Chicago area. And it was really wonderful. They uh, housed us, they uh, fed us, set us up, uh, set my father up with a job, and life was really good. I was very, very happy. I had a baby brother born um, later uh, when I was uh, around nine, nine and a half. And then when I turned nine and a half, I came home one day to a house full of people and found out my father had killed himself. Uh, he was very depressed. Uh, I don't know all the details, but totally my life turned upside down because I lost not only my father, but I lost a mother because my mother had to go to work and then to gain any kind of career that would give her money, she had to start going to school at night, which I admire her for. She was persevering, but it, again, a sense of abandonment. But I had decided, I remember the day I found out my dad was gone, that I would never need anyone else, that I would just become independent. And that was probably the start of my downward, my downward slope, so to speak. Mom, of course, was young. She was 29 years old, so she started to date. And I didn't like that, of course. Uh, I never liked any of the guys that she dated. And then one day she uh, dated another guy um, who she landed up marrying when I was in seventh grade. Very difficult transition. He didn't like me. I didn't like him. He was um, a gambler. He was addicted to pornography. He was a less than good provider. And eventually, that marriage started to fail, and then my mother started to drink. And in that time, she tried to kill herself two times. Neither time did she succeed. I praise the Lord for that. But again, a sense of abandonment. So the drinking continued, and I really wanted to get away. Now I was through high school, and I wanted to go to college. I didn't care where I went or for whatever reason, but ISU, which is in Blooming, Bloomington, normal area, was reasonable and it was close, so I applied and I got accepted. The problem was that you could only be a farmer or a teacher, and neither one did I want to be, but I didn't care. I just wanted to go and have fun. I wanted to uh, date boys because I turned to boyfriends through high school as well and college and partied. I was the party girl. I know you can't believe this, but I was the party girl of the floor. And I did meet a, uh, a young guy who was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, and we got engaged. Um, praising the Lord, I didn't marry him because he was an atheist and proclaimed it. And I, we broke up. And as God would have had it, because I know he had his hand on my life, I became a teacher, and I really, really loved it. As you know, I love teaching Sunday school here, and I don't know what I would have done because it was a profession I didn't want, but God provided it for me. So then I got my first teaching job, and there I met the love of my life, of course. He was the principal, and everything was great except he was married. That didn't bother me because we loved each other. So I continued in that relationship, and of course there was always promise of divorce, and nothing, nothing would come of it, and it continued. And after five years, I was starting to go down a slippery slope again. My drinking increased, my depression, my um, 
hopelessness continued. So I thought, well, I'll leave the teaching job and I'll leave the school and go get a job somewhere else. Well, temporarily, because I couldn't get a teaching job right away, I got a job at a very exclusive store, and some of you may know or remember it. It's called Bonwit Teller. It was in Oak Brook. And at Christmas time, they had a little club for men to buy for their wives or girlfriends or both. And we would serve liquor there and, and show them gifts they could buy. The whole thing was to have them spend a lot of money. And I was the manager. They put me in charge there. So I started to work there. And of course, I had other women working for me. And one of the first days that I was there, a beautiful girl came in. She looked like a model. And it wasn't just her physical appearance. It was her whole demeanor was nothing but joy and peace and happiness. And I hated her right away because I had none of that. And I was planning at this time that when the job ended and nothing came, and I was already planning my suicide because that's all I knew. That was what my family um, did when they couldn't handle life. They just killed themselves or tried to kill themselves. So I, this was my out. So I was collecting pills. Um, I was going to get through this job and see maybe the other issue would resolve itself, which, it, of course, it didn't. And so I was upset with her that she looked so happy and everything, and everybody was greeting her and hugging her and saying, Patty, we're so glad to see you. And so I immediately took her out of that situation. I said, no, you need to come by me, and you need to look at all this merchandise and see its pricing so you know what to tell the customer. And she goes, okay. Well, that started two hours of conversation that no one interrupted. And to this day, I think God just kept people at bay. I'd see people sort of coming in, but then they would leave. It was like we had something around us, which I now know was the Holy Spirit. And she told me about her Jesus. And she would tell me things like, oh, Jesus would help her pick out what to wear because he knew what her day was going to be like. I thought, now there's a Jesus I could use because I was really into clothes because that was my self-worth at that time, clothing and everything else. And I immediately grabbed onto Jesus and I knew what she was talking about because back when the Presbyterian Church sponsored us, I went to Sunday school and I learned about the Bible, but I only learned about it. I didn't know about the salvation experience. I knew of Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. So I took him in and I was immediately changed. It was the most supernatural thing that I've ever had happen to me. And she kept saying, you don't understand what I'm saying. I said, I do, I do. And so I went home that night and this, I don't have time to tell you everything, but I had miracle after miracle. And then the next time I saw her, I said, I can't wait to tell you what Jesus has done. And she says, so you know what I'm talking about? I said, I do. And the next day, because I was on a probably three to four scotch on the rock every day diet of liquor, and the next day I didn't want to drink anymore. It bothered me when the people around me swore, because I, I swore all the time. And they looked at me and said, there's something different about you. They could tell something had happened. And my boyfriend thought I had met another guy because I was so full of joy. And he was used to me being despondent and upset because he wasn't getting a divorce. But I was just full, full of joy. He continued to do miracles. And you know, our Lord was so patient with me. I was not convicted of the adultery until a few months later when I was in church and I opened the Bible and there it was. And I was ready to hear it then, because I already wanted the Lord more than I wanted something else, but it was tough. And it took about two years of struggle for me to completely release that relationship. And yes, he did get a divorce, but then I knew it wasn't what God wanted for me. So now here I am, because I was 27 when all this happened. I was, you know, I went to a Bible study. This, the girl took me, her name was Patty, took me to a Bible study where I learned the word. So I turned 30, 
31, 32. And I'm pretty upset with the Lord because I don't have anybody in my life because I deserve a husband, right? You know. And I had to deal with that too. So one day I remember kneeling down by my bed and saying, it's okay, Lord. If I never get married, all I want is that joy and peace. And what happens two weeks later, Bob, who I knew for several years, calls me and asks me out. And I said to him, I said, well, why did you wait so long? And he said, I don't know, you just look different to me. God had changed. I must have had a very bitter um, demeanor about me, and I was thinking I was getting a raw deal. So, of course, you know Bob. You know that I got Rachel, who you know in the, um, at the edge, and my, our grandchildren. And did the gospel change my life? Yes, and I'll be forever grateful for the girl who told me later, Patty says, I usually do not share my faith, but I am so thankful she did, and I would encourage that you would be open. You'll never know how you might change someone's life. Thank you for letting me share my testimony. Oh, God. 
It can't be anything else It can't be anything else You are good And you can only be good It can't be anything else It can't be anything else You are good Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. As always, we're so grateful 
that you took time to be with us. We normally love to give you questions at the end of sermons to consider in your house churches or however you gather, uh, but today we're only going to focus on one idea, and it's this. How has the proclamation of the gospel changed your life, and how is it changing your life? Now, here's the thing. There is no pressure to share, but I have a feeling that you're going to want to process some of the things that Eve shared today and maybe some points in the sermon. And I just really want you to think about how has hearing the gospel changed you or started a process of change? Maybe you're just spiritually curious and you're, you're sort of wondering what's next. There's no pressure to share. And if you're uncomfortable with sharing, just sit back with open minds and hearts and just hear from others in your gathering. May God's light shine brightly through you as you proclaim his story. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.